Welcome to the Wilson Center. Uh, my name is Dave Rajeski. I direct the Science and Technology Innovation Program. And uh, welcome to the first post-election meeting of the Federal Games Group. Um, <clears throat> when, it, when I talked to Constance I know, a few months ago, one of the things we committed to do was to host this group up to the election, past the election, <clears throat> and through the transition, <clears throat> um, which hopefully will be <clears throat> No, I don't. I don't want to make a prediction about the transition. I hope it'll be. Good. <laughs> I hope it'll be free of major bumps and cliffs. Um, and when we we had some discussions about what would be useful, and I think one of the things that has come up a lot talking to you individually and as a group is just this whole issue of how do we get games out there and get them used after we've built them. The whole issue of you know publication and outreach and how to drive people and and users to games. Uh, so I thought. Uh, one way to use these meetings is actually to bring people in from the outside that could could talk about that. Um, so I think that's what we're going to try to do today, and we can have some discussions also with you afterwards or later on about you know who else would be useful to hear from. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Constance in a sec just to say hello and give you an update. But I thought it'd be useful just to know who's in the room. I just. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're webcasting this, so we can just... Yeah. Uh, Josh DeLong with the SBA. Jacqueline Gardy, Department of State. Alan Cheville, National Science Foundation. Ori Hoffer, GSA. Dan Sonnet, National Endowment for the Arts. Tim Orr, CDC. And Garth Jensen from Navy. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of just the the uh, web the webcast will, is, will be archived. It'll go up on our website, and also the slides will go up there. So everybody that's watching will have access uh, to the slides, and also historically we'll be able to um, access the archive presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Give me a mic. Am I live over here? <laughs> Well, first, thank you for coming and thank you for hosting the meeting. Um, welcome to post-election. We can all exhale and move on to very big business now. Um, so a few updates. I was hoping to have something very tangible, my predecessor, my uh, successor to announce to you. But I, at, at this point, the machinations are in place. But I'm going to hold off on telling you who that would be until it's actually confirmed and official. My um, hope is that it may be January, but realistically, it could be February or March. Um, as I've said before, even though I have transitioned from White House OSTP back to academics, because I'm still working with groups that we established as part of the last year, year and a half's work on games, I'll continue to work with this group until we get uh, my, the next particular person in OSTP in place or as long as I'm able to do that. I think one thing we ought to be asking ourselves about, and we really haven't taken time for this yet because we were kind of waiting to find out um, how the election would unfold, which has a consequence for this group only in that because it's a White House agency and office that's, um, that's in some ways hosting and facilitating this, making sure that those staff are still in place, and indeed they are mission accomplished. Um, um, but I do think that it would be a really valuable thing at some point very soon for us to think about what are the things we want to accomplish over the next year now that the election has passed. Today we're going to hear about marketing simply because um, this is a topic that very few of us know very much about, both academic, agencies, etc. And so what you find, again, I'm just going to recap some of the goal here, was that what you find is that when, um, when we're doing uh, investments or trying to get proposals about um, toward game type uh, interventions, let's say, uh, written in those proposals is lots of sort of notions of how, how that product or that piece of media might get to scale, quote unquote, how it might reach a broader audience. And that's actually very, very difficult to do. And many of us have sort of talked about the barriers to doing that. But one thing we've run into is that sort of understanding markets, understanding how to reach those markets, um, these, are not, these are not our typical skill sets. 
So um, I think today will be really valuable in just helping us kind of understand at least the problem space or what to look for or how to at least know uh, what pitfalls we might avoid in the investments that we make and sort of understanding that landscape some. But I would like to see after, maybe after today's meeting, at the end of it, maybe we can talk about what's the best way to move forward with what our next sort of year or 18 months goals are. If we imagine that we'll have new leadership coming in, say, January, February, March, um, I think the, the agenda will certainly be shaped by that new leadership, but we can start that conversation now, and I think we ought to because this group has never been sort of top down. It's always been sort of us trying to um, buoy up our sort of shared understanding around games and game investments. So we'll, let's talk about that some maybe toward the end if we can save a little bit of time. And then I'm going to hand it back to our actual speaker. Great. Well, thank you for being here, and thanks for, uh, you know, motivating us and encouraging us to uh, put this together. Um, so I'm here. Welcome to everyone, and welcome all of you on uh, web here joining us by webcast. Um, please be aware that uh, I will actually try to be a facilitator for people not in the room uh, to bring them into the room. So uh, you all should have my uh, email address, diane.tucker at wilsoncenter.org. You're very welcome as you're watching if you have questions um, that you would like to place to Shama. Uh, please send them to me, and I will articulate them, voice them uh, on your behalf so that she can, um, so we can, you can be present uh, and absent all at once. Okay. Um, here, as I mentioned, is uh, Shama Haider Kabani, CEO of an online social media marketing business called Market Zen Group. She's also the author of a social media marketing guide, The Zen of Social Media Marketing. Uh, Shama holds a master's degree in organizational communication from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, her clients serves her company serves clients from around the world, and those clients range from uh, publicly held Fortune 500 companies to privately held small businesses and also uh, nonprofit organizations. She's also, uh, after the Arab Spring protests in Egypt, uh, served as a mentor to young tech um, entrepreneurs in Cairo. Um, we look forward to talk to learning from Shama about trends in social media, uh, as well as case studies and specific tactics by which we might uh, get our games more broadly played and adopted. And again, this really, uh, we've been talking about it, we really would like this to be a QA. and a So do please um, gather questions and, and be, be, feel free to voice them, because we really want this to be something that uh, means by which you can learn new things. Thanks. Thank you. OK, so Shama. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Can I get a hand towel, Joe? Would that be OK? No, it's a small group, which is always fun. I'll wait so our, our webcasters can join in. Thank you. You guys can hear me just fine without it too, right? All right, not a problem. All right, very good. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Social media is changing the landscape, and uh, my goal today, I know all of you guys are probably at a different level in terms of where you are with your games, where you might be in terms of even your social media or marketing knowledge. So we'll, what we'll try to do is put everybody on the, the same level as far as what social media is, what we're looking at right now. I'll share a couple of digital trends that I'm seeing really approach 2013 and further, things that you I think will be useful, not just in terms of marketing, but in just terms of all your initiatives that you might be working on in terms of engagement or, or marketing in general. And then I'll share very specific tactics, things that you can do to market your games um, more or less right away. And then we'll just do Q&A. Does that sound OK? Yes? OK, perfect. I really want to make this worth your time and uh, we promise that it'll, it'll be productive. All right, so I want to give you a brief background on myself. Diane gave you a very nice official version, but I'll give you sort of the non-official version. I did go to the University of Texas at Austin, graduated with a master's in organizational communication, uh, but I actually did my thesis on Twitter. So for those of you who are, are academics, or, no, on Twitter. No, no, on. <laughs> I, I, it, no, it was not 140 characters, although I did use it to collect my data. Uh, I think they, they said that was like the fastest data collection ever because it was just a survey. Uh, and I sent it out to Twitters. But um, this is at a time where Twitter only had like 2,000 users. And today, I think the last count is like over 500 million users access Twitter. So um, 
after I graduated and I, ha I thought this was awesome and I get one out there and when you have a great idea, I think the natural inclination is everybody's going to love this. So when I went out there and I was like, don't you, you know, I want to work for your company, you have social media. And they looked at me like I was crazy and they said, this is the stuff our kid uses. This has no future. Like, what is that blue bird? Uh, you know, I'd wear the little Twitter t-shirt and people would just be like, what cartoon is that? I'm like, it's not a cartoon. Here's how it works. Um, so long story short, I got out there. The market was not ready. So I started my own company. Uh, we're called the Marketing Zen Group. We grew very quickly. We are now 30 individuals. So I think it's been a little, a little over four years. Um, and we work with clients all over the world on social media marketing, but we're a full service web marketing firm. So we really do it all uh, from website building, SEO, so forth. So uh, any online marketing questions in general, I can probably take and, and hopefully answer. And I share this with you to just showcase a little bit of my perspective in the sense that I have a very academic take on things. Uh, I don't think that ever went away completely. So I, I look at things from that perspective, but also from a practical standpoint, this is how I built up my own company, but this is how we're also working with all our clients, whether they're nonprofit, private, you know, for all their different goals and, and using social media as well. So just to give you a little bit of framework from where I'm coming from. So what is social media? And I, you know, I, I know you guys know what Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn are. So I'm not here to explain sort of what the platforms are, but really to encourage you to start thinking about social media in a different way. So yes, one definition is websites where people connect and communicate and collaborate, but there's a bigger definition of social media. And that's the fact that people are now the media. And that's, that's a really big shift. So when p you stop thinking about it in terms of how can we use Facebook or how can we use LinkedIn or how can we use YouTube and ask rather how do we utilize the fact that people are now the media and how they you know, access information. So Twitter's been faster than the, than the API for, God, about three years now, right? Um, Hurricane Sandy, perfect example. Things happen and people were looking to Twitter to get information because the news was getting information, the traditional news was getting their information from Twitter. So things have really changed. I mean, just think about the last time you went to a restaurant. How many of you looked at Yelp for review before deciding to eat there? You know, especially true if you travel, you're always looking at that. For a movie, you know, you're asking your friends online, hey, is this good? You're, we're constantly taking that information in. The picture here is just to highlight something uh, which I think is cute, but very indicative of the future. Has anybody seen this, the two-year-old on, on YouTube? So if you have, yeah, it's great. For those who haven't, it's, uh, it's a video of a two-year-old who thinks the magazine is a broken iPad. So for all of us, when we think the iPad's like a step up, for us, like, oh, it's so evolved. But for a whole generation, that is the status quo. Right, that anything below that is is not accessible, and so it's really funny because uh, she, you know, she's trying to get the pictures to move, and they don't, and she just doesn't understand why this magazine is so static. Um, and as any smart two-year-old, she makes sure her finger is still working because she's just figured out how to use the digits. And so this is a very smart two-year-old. She's like, okay, so the digits still work, so it's got to be this magazine that's broken. And I think more and more, the technology that we so far have taken sort of for granted, or many of us see as, this is so cool, is actually just the norm. You know, uh, for apps, for example, were so exciting, but now it's almost like, you know, it's very cliche to say, isn't there an app for that? So, Entire neighborhood corners have shifted, right? The online world has become such, not just an extension of the offline world, but in many ways, its own world. Um, I was r reading some very interesting research that said kids in college today keep in better touch with the parents than they have any generation before. And it's not all of a sudden because kids love their parents more or are more attached. It's really because it's much more accessible. And the big thing is texting. Because it's easy to text mom and dad, like, I'm fine, I'm you know, back in the dorm, it's, I'm here. And so it, it's, it's really neat. And uh, they've done research that shows grandparents feel like they have a stronger relationship with their grandkids, even though they're not physically in the same location, because they can keep up with sort of a lot of times the things that we say are so mundane, but really can be so meaningful to certain people. And the big thing right now and I, is, is digital footprints, right? The fact that every individual, every organization, every game has some sort of digital footprint in content that can be traced back. And so 
the things that you do right now, the games that you build, the initiatives that you launch, it all goes to building this digital footprint, whether positive, negative, or neutral, of, of, your, of your organization's legacy. And never before have we really had this sense of a digital footprint. And that goes for every individual in this room, too. I bet if I Googled each and every one of your names, I'd find something, right? And so that is your digital footprint. The only question often is, is do you want to actually proactively participate in creating a positive digital footprint? Or do you want it created by outside sources? Because nonetheless, it gets created. So something to keep in mind, and just a fun little fact I'll share, um, 2010 survey from AVG showed that 81% of kids under the age of two already have some kind of digital footprint. Email addresses, social network presence, something. Um, that number jumps up to 91% for American kids. So a lot of what I've actually recently been doing is talking to high schoolers, middle schoolers, uh, parents whose kids are in elementary school who are like, how do we create positive digital footprints for our kids? Um, but I just, I, that really is a tangent, but I share that to sort of bring us to the sense that everything that you do online um, serves to add to this digital footprint of your agency, of your legacy, if you look at it in that way. So very specifically, to bring us a little bit back, how can social media help in the things that you're doing? And I know there's a lot of, and so we'll talk about what it can do and what it can't do, right? So some myth busting, because I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about you know, social media in many ways is glorified and vilified. So what's really the truth? Okay, so how can social media help? What it can do, and specifically in terms of your gaming, right, the games that you're working is, is increasing your reach. Not since the 1950s have you had access to reach like that. What I mean by this is, if in the 1950s you were going after a specific demographic, let's say women in their 30s, you could pretty much take an ad out at a certain time on television and you could reach about 80% of that demographic because the average 30-something old woman would have two kids, go to church on Sundays, had a very specific schedule, right? But of course, now, if you're trying to reach that same demographic of 30-something women, it's totally different. There's no TV ad that'll give you 80% you know, of that market. It is very fractured. It is very multifaceted, not just from a marketing standpoint, but in terms of demographics itself. As our demographics change, as you know, it's hard to find two women in their 30s who share the exact same schedule. So while you still may have a mom at home with two kids in church on Sundays, it's very likely that you may have someone who's an independent, you know, career woman, no kids, goes, you know, rock climbing on the weekends. So very different. And what social media does is gives you a platform where all these people, despite their differences, still come together. So Facebook has a billion users. Right? Um, YouTube is the second biggest in terms of searches that happen, millions of visitors. So the reach that's possible with social media, you just don't have on any other platform. The other nice thing is that it gives you very targeted reach. So you can really go after your very specific demographics based on people's interests and hone in on that. Of course, you can increase adoption of the game. So the idea I'm guessing here is that you know, the game is a means to an end, getting that message across. And so the more people adopt the, the game, the better. Engagement and feedback, what do people like about the game? What do they not like about it? What would they like to see improve? So a lot of times what you see, especially in very tech-driven worlds, is there's always iterations, right? 2.0, 3.0, the next big thing. But how many times is feedback really incorporated as to what's important? So the social media also provides a great platform for getting that sort of feedback. And of course, retaining. You know, there's nothing easier than downloading an app, but there's also nothing as easy as removing an app or discarding it or moving on to something else. So to retain these people that are going to engage with the game, social media is a great platform to sort of carry that story over and to continue to build that community. And of course, to make it easy for them to share with other people. That's, and there's that very much that component of, we'll talk about this viral in just a second, but to encourage people to share the things that you put out there. And you know, the, the number one reason people share is because it's easy. And the number one reason they don't is because it's not easy. I mean, we all know that people will do good if we make it easy for them, right? If you're walking down the street, there's a piece of trash, and you spot the trash can right there, chances are you'll pick it up and you'll put it in. But what if you don't see a trash can in sight? 
you'll keep walking. Even, you know, the best of us, if, we, if we're busy, we're just not going to do it. So the idea is how do you make it as easy as possible for people to share what you're putting out there? And in terms of the game being an extension of your overall goals, your overall messaging, what you're trying to do, this is what it really does, helps you build community. Giving exclusives, by the way, is a great way to do that. You know, people who participate in the game get previews that others don't. People who participate in this game maybe get like um, interesting interviews, something that you know the community will value. Um, building credibility and trust. This, like I said, this becomes more than just about the game. It becomes about the digital footprint of the agency and the legacy that you're trying to leave behind. It helps you create transparency as well. So a lot of times it's not just a game, you know, some organization put out there, uh, now we're, we're, we may or may not, you know, pick it up. We may or may not engage, but it really does say, "Hey, look, we acknowledge that social media is a two-way street. We're putting this out there, but we also want to hear back. So this isn't just hear something. We want you to educate yourselves, right, on what we're trying to do, but allowing to making sure that you have that channel of communication open." So what social media isn't? And I think this is just as important. One, it isn't free. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of misconceptions around that, which is like, well, isn't Facebook free? Isn't Twitter free? So yes, technically, you can use those tools for free. But to be able to do a lot more with those tools, and I'll give you an example too, um, and to, to use strategy to do actual campaigns, that costs money. And it costs, I think what's even more important these days, time. So in a way, social media is going to be an investment of, of money and time. And to be able to say, well, it's just you know, something that's free that we can tack on at the end of a project is just not the best way to go about it. And then this other idea that I hear a lot, which is social media going viral. How many of you guys have, have heard that? In, in <laughs> <laughs> so here's the biggest myth is that you can't, you can't <laughs> despite your best intentions, you can't make a virus. Okay, you can't make something go viral <laughs> online. Now you can you can dissect things that go viral, and you can add um, you can take from you know social uh, economics and psychology and what's worked in the past and humor and personality. So we, you can do a lot to make sure that something is inherently has components that are more likely to go viral. But there's no such thing as a viral campaign. No, it either happens or it doesn't happen. But it's it's almost impossible to say. Let's you know we get these calls as an agency, right? And it's like, okay, we want to create a viral campaign, and that's just <laughs> that's really hard because no one can guarantee that. That's just not how it works. Otherwise, are you guys familiar with that Open Gangnam Hine song, right? That very popular. I'm not gonna dance to it. I promise. <laughs> not gonna. Yeah, yeah. I'm just waiting. Like, oh, what is that song again? <laughs> Give us more. Maybe maybe it'll come to us. But really, like, who would have imagined that would have gone viral, right? So there is that, that idea of, of hit or miss in the very word virals. All right, quick. Organic campaigns take time, and they take time to set up, research, strategy, and they have to be consistent. So again, when we get calls and someone says, well, well actually, we did just get, I was telling you guys, we got this call from a company that's doing a, a mobile app, and they said, we're 20 days from launch. What can you do? And we said, nothing. You know, you could do advertising, but advertising is the only thing you could do in 20 days because you're not going to build a community. You're not going to put together a plan. It doesn't happen like that. So, uh, in fact, we often recommend when you're creating your games, you have someone on your team who has a marketing angle because the best thing you can do is make the games inherently um, more likely to go viral, have better, you know, great UI, uh, user interface, make them so they're likable, they're easy to use. So a lot of times we'll work with uh, our clients. We have a couple of clients that do like dating apps and they haven't even launched yet. We've just been working with them in terms of how do you make it so it's going to be much more likely to be shared by others. Um, and that takes us to the, the really the, the last point, I guess we'll come back to the other one, is a substitute for, for a solid game. Social media is not a band-aid and you see that a lot. Right? People will call us and they say, I want a social media marketing strategy. For what? This product we know is really going to do well. Oh, why? Because my mom said she loves it. You know, okay, that's great. So where's the market analysis? Where's, where, it's not, you know, social media marketing is not a substitute for the basics. If it's a bad game, meaning people don't really want to play that game, meaning it's, it's giving them something that only two people are really excited about in the world, 
then no amount of marketing is going to help. Or if it is, it's really going to fall short. So you really have to make sure that your basics are very strong for social media to work. So think about it this way, okay? It's an amplifier. Social media platforms are, are amplifiers, but they aren't a substitute. The mediums aren't a substitute for the message. Meaning what you have to say has to be good. And if it's good, it gets amplified to great. That's the beauty of it. But if it's not so good, you probably don't want to keep putting it out there because you are going to see that backlash at the same time. And then finally, it isn't a standalone. So social media marketing works best when it's part of a bigger strategy. When PR, when web, when SEO, when all these components play together, that's where you see social media really shine. But it's really hard to do in sort of a corner by itself and say, run a campaign. You can run an advertising campaign, but to really run a social media campaign for your engaging people at that level and leveraging their networks, it has to be part of a bigger game plan. So hopefully that helps clarify a little bit. All right, so some digital trends that I'm seeing that tie into what works with social media and, and what doesn't. The first is identity-based ecosystems. So how many are actually on Facebook or have a profile? All right, so the majority. A profile. All right, a profile. Yeah, so, and so then you guys are familiar with the identity-based ecosystem. Hence, timelines. You guys familiar with timelines? the new Facebook look. So a lot of people are, you know, what's with the Facebook timelines? I don't know why they did this, but I'll tell you why they did this. And it actually goes back to me being an academic. And remember I studied Twitter um, and did my thesis on it. The question I asked was why in the world would people use this network? That really was my question. It was like, what would compel people to share? I just had a PBJ or, you know, walking the dog. Like, where is the value in that? What is, but people are sharing it and, and it's, in, you know, increasing every day. So my hypothesis was it allows people to connect and communicate with each other, right? It connects us like we've never been connected before and people want that. I was wrong. That's the secondary reason people use social networks. The primary reason people were using social networking is to showcase their own identities. Okay, so my first reaction is, wow, we're so narcissistic, right? Can't believe that this is why we're using social networking sites. But if you dig a little bit deeper, uh, and you actually, there's whole uh, entire fields of study in identity research and how we form our identity, and it's always been this way. So go back to like kindergarten, right? You're sitting next to someone, and uh, you're like, I like cookies. They're like, I like cookies too. You're right, and they're playing with a blue crayon and you're like, you like blue, I like blue. Like, this is crazy, we should be best friends. Um, so we've always created our identities, right? So we like to think that we're very individu individualistic and that we are a product of our own thoughts, but really more than, more than anything, we're much more a reflection of what, how we were raised and how we adapted to that. So how many of you guys went to high school here, had lockers, decorated lockers? Yes, no, oh, I know you're lying, you had posters <laughs> in there. Right, but so if you think about digital Facebook timelines, it's really no different than the locker, right? Or your bedroom wall. It very much showcased who you were as an individual. And that's why Facebook spends so much time creating these timelines and giving people all this ability to do stuff on their own profiles because it gets this. Now, what this means for people who are creating games and get hoping to get you know, uh, citizens engaged in the things that you're doing is that you have to really smart marketers understand the play into this is important. Meaning, it's not important what your game says about itself, about your agency, about your mission. It's so much more important what it says about the individuals playing that game. And if you take one thing out of here, I hope that this is it. That's sort of the beauty of social media. This is what people miss often. It's not about the brand. It's not about the campaign. It's what does it say about the people? So if I may use the presidential campaign, right, of President Obama, and the, just even the first time around, it wasn't here's what, you know, here's change. It was yes, we can, right? It was we can make the change happen. It gave sort of that power to people. So all of a sudden, it wasn't about the president or his campaign. It became very much about what it said about the people who were electing that president. Does that make sense? Sort of a really, so that's why certain companies do really well with it. That's why like the local bakery down the street is going to have more likes than, your, any, than any page you set up on Facebook because liking that says more about people than liking an agency. 
Yeah. So I'm not on Facebook, but everybody okay. around me is. So, <laughs> um, it, so it's sort of two questions then. It's, so this whole, identi oh, sorry. this whole identity based thing. Why, when Facebook implemented Timeline, I mean, the feedback I got from those around me was they hated that and they resisted it a lot. And I don't know if it's just because you know re you resist change. Yeah. And do you think Facebook consciously did this research that you're talking about to implement Timeline, or they just kind of did it? Yeah, I don't know if they if they've like academically studied this concept as as I was sort of lucky enough to stumble on and do, but they understand it. And here's a question that I think would be interesting. If you asked all of these folks that said, I hate the timeline, but if you asked them, how many of you updated your cover photo? It would be a resounding yes. So the 10 people is like, this sucks. Now I got to go find a cover photo to update this, right? So I think there is something to sa said about like, we don't really like change. We don't, and, and especially with social media, when it's like, okay, figured out how this works, Facebook changes the game. Right? And they do this also uh, as a strategy because they're trying to keep people on their toes. But as, as the things that you do, even with games, so much more about as you create this, what does this say about the individual you actually want playing this game? And if it's like nothing, then that's, that's a red flag because it should, right? It should. Then that's the reason people share things. Because like I'm saying, that local bakery that someone might like on Facebook, that says a lot about me. I support local businesses. I like cupcakes, right? There's, there's certain things that, that allow it to be sort of a window into who I am. And if you can play into that, then more power to you. I'm sorry, just to in, in relating to yes. the election and to uh, Facebook. Actually, within this last election, there was a, a James Fowler who's done a lot of work on connectivity. Uh, you can see this actually written up in The Atlantic Magazine recently. But um, they've actually, on Election Day, conducted an experiment on Facebook uh, where people would indicate whether they had voted. Some people were actually given information by their friends about whether they had voted or whether they hadn't voted. And, uh, this, and so they were actually trying to see whether there was a social influence, whether people were more inclined to vote if they found out that their friends were voting. And this is uh, building off work they had done before in which they had determined, in fact, that people uh, sharing information about themselves and their behavior through Facebook actually did influence how other people behaved. So uh, just to give you that information and just uh, say that they did that experiment, experiment again to see what, uh, they don't yet have the data results from election week, uh, you know, election last week, but um, there is, uh, you might want to take a look at this uh, work by Fowler in this article, uh, did Facebook give Democrats the upper hand in the Atlantic Magazine of November 8th, 2012? That's great, yeah, absolutely, yes sir. Um, to, to try and get you to connect two things you said. One is it's it's interactive, it's two-way, and the other that, that it's what it says about the people who use it. What does it do to... What, what does it do to your audience? Uh, <clears throat> now, to connect those two things, the, the idea that social media is interactive mm -hmm. and the idea that it's what it says about the your people who are yeah. participating... What does it do if you've got a government agency who says we jumped in, just hypothetically, sure. we've jumped into social media and then they never respond. They never, they, yeah. they use it as broadcast instead of interactive. What does that do to your audience? Uh, well, it hurts, certainly, right? And, and so what it does is it builds that firewall, like it's, and it makes it seem, so here's what I would say. If the agency is only using it as a broadcast tool, then to make that very clear. And ma just by make it clear, I'm saying put it on the page, put it on Twitter saying, guess what? This is only a one way, you know, don't leave your comments here. If you have something, call us, but we're only using this to share information. I think that there is, it's seen with a little, uh, with little cynicism because by the very nature of social media, it's meant to be a platform where people can connect and, and do that. But at the same time, if for example, uh, FEMA needs to get information out there they may not have someone manning that but right but they've got to get these important updates out and they're really hoping that people will share it in that case it may work but i think in that way you have to be very transparent and say look we get that this is not what the tool is for but this is how we're choosing to use it and but here's ways that in which you can communicate with us um so and and to the other point i think that was a very good point where you said you know i'm talking about making it so it plays into their identity. What does it say about them versus interactivity? But here's the thing, to m even get to the level of making it interactive, you have to give them something to engage with. And a great way to get them to engage is to make it about them. 
right? So rather than like that's why these ga- a lot of these games do so well. Avatars, the whole rise of really virtual worlds is because it allows people to project sort of their personalities and their wants and desires. And really, there's nothing more powerful in in social sciences than that. And so if you can pull that per, that aspect of personalization into the games, then that can be really powerful. And on that note, I've got the newest expansion of The Sims 3 waiting for me. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's great. All right, so the second big trend is content curation and aggregation. And if you can in any way support this, um, this is what I mean. So we were very information hungry for a long time. And then the web came around, and we loved it. And we, you know, people used to put like on their profiles, uh, like long walks on the beach and surfing the web. People still, I don't think, I hope they don't, because you, but you could. Remember, you could really surf the web in a day. Like there were only 20 web pages, like made with, you know, angel <laughs> cities and like the geo city sites. <laughs> like, what'd you do today, honey? Oh, I surfed the web, and that's all there was to the web. And so we were, we were really information hungry. And now it's gotten to the point where it's too much information, but we still need the information. The only difference is we need it within context and relevance. And that changes a lot. And what this means is your games, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, not everybody's going to download it all the time, right? So there's apps like survivor apps in terms of uh, like uh, flashlights and what you need, like emergency preparedness apps. They saw a huge rise right you know, during Sandy and after, of course, because relevant and they were relevant and they were timely and they were within that context. And so as you're building these games, you have to ask, like, are people going to use this within a context? Are they going to use it in general? Like, what are we trying to really go after? And more and more, this is giving the rise to content curation and aggregation sites. So here's an example. How many are familiar with Pinterest? The demon that is Pinterest. <laughs> it's, it is. It is a crazy addictive site because what it does is let you, you know pin. It, it's so simple if you think about it. It just lets you pin images. But it really highlights this trend so well because here's the difference. Let's say I'm shopping for an outfit and I could go to Nordstrom's and I could you know look at every dress on their page. I could do that at a million other sites. Or I can go to Pinterest and look at what my most fashionable friends think is appropriate for you know the holiday season. Right. Or I mean for anything, for Christmas toys, for uh, collectors, for homes, for decorative, like anything that you can think of that's uh, consumer based, if you will, people are turning to Pinterest because it's helping them take all this content and curate it where they can sort of pick and choose what makes sense. Does that make sense, this, or, this trend of, and we'll see more of this. This is why Pinterest really took off, by the way. Same website five years ago wouldn't have nearly done so well. But it did because the right time and right place, and that also matters for games. You know, right time and right place, there's a lot to be said about that in any type of social media campaign. Hence, another reason why you can't really predict if something will go viral. Because there is that component of, you know, that tipping point, if you will. If you look at the revolution that happened in, in Cairo, in a way, it's like, why then? Why the Arab Spring? Why at that time? Why did that one guy, you know, setting himself up on fire serve as a domino effect for, for the whole MENA region? And in many ways, the answer is we just don't know why that one thing at that time. But we know that the time and place were right. Here's another site called Listly. It allows people to make and share lists. Everything from what to do when you're moving, of what to do when you're, um, just the craziest things, productivity apps, you know, everything that people would imagine making a list for, people make and share. So you're going to see a rise in trends like this, content curation and aggregation. So all this information, how do we make sense of it, and how do we access it when we need it? So um, I'm sure you guys, do you guys use like a maps navigation app, right? Like Google Maps or something like that. It's a very useful app, but it would be very annoying if it was on all the time. Because most times you know exactly where you're going, where you're coming, but when you need it, it becomes extremely important. Right? So a lot of this is, even with Google, some of the next trends are how do we figure out what people are looking for using context, not just keywords. So the, let's say the word pink. Okay, pink could be the color, the band, the, the artist. There's a lot of different, you know, depending on what you were thinking when you type that in. But Google's working on its algorithms now to better capture that. So it'll say, did you mean the artist? Did you mean the color? Right, but it's getting better at capturing that sort of information too. All right, the third big trend I'm seeing is, is online video. 
where it's becoming device agnostic. And I think the same can be said for apps and games. A lot of it is becoming device agnostic. I predict that in the next 10 years, if not sooner, you won't have a single game that can only be played on one console. I really think that games, because people won't stand for anything less, I think they'll be like, what do you mean I can't use it just because I use this particular system? And so we'll see more of that. Um, and I'll show you some examples that I think do a really good job of combining sort of these trends. So this is a, a web series called Aim High. And of course, it was about a high school student who poses as a CIA agent in his, in his off hours. But it was released on Facebook as, uh, as a mini web series. But what's really interesting about it is that you could watch two versions. You could watch a standard episode, or you could view a personalized episode. And if you did the personalized, it would take elements from your profile and integrate it into the, into the video. So like the characters, like the playlist would be like your playlist. Right? Or they're like running down the hallway, the picture on the wall would be pictures of like your friends. And so it would in integrate elements of your profile into the web series. But just an example, it still gave you an option of the standard, but I think more and more we're also heading towards this more I identity based ecosystem, P personalization becomes more integrated, um, and just things become a lot more s seamless. So, it's still funny to me that we talk about social media as something separate, and I realize why that is. But I also think in the future, we won't talk about it like social media. It'll be understood that media is social and that this is very inherent in what we need to do. Right now, I think for many ways, it still seems like it's separate. But just like you don't say, I'm going to telephone this person, right? Or you'd like, you'll say, I'll get in touch with them. It just means like you'll email them or call them. Like there's. It, it, you don't specify that because it seems so outdated. And the same thing is going to happen with the, the, you know, the phraseology social media. It's going to be like, who says that? What media isn't social? Right? It's going to be very different. And so here's another example of commerce and, uh, and video mo moving together. So Target did this web series called Falling For You. But the different, the cool thing is, I guess, in this way is that as you watch the web series, you can buy anything in there that you like. So you're watching and you're like, oh, I really like that top she's wearing. You can click and buy it right there from Target and get it shipped to your local store one click without ever pausing the video. <laughs> so I realize it's different than what you guys are trying to accomplish, but you have to see what people are getting used to and what's becoming the new normal. Already there's deals with all these cable companies for people to connect their accounts so you can buy whatever you see on TV and like, and you never have to leave, and you never actually have to stop watching television. Am I scaring you guys yet? Should we just stop and <laughs> get, call another session until all this can be, <laughs> can be integrated better? But these are just trends, and as this becomes more the norm, you know, some of the things that, are, that may seem so cutting edge, not so much anymore, right? in terms of how fast technology is moving and what people are expecting. Because regardless of the fact that this is probably a very innovative bunch of people in this room for what just what you're trying to do in, in your sectors, um, you're still competing for attention of consumers in the private market and you know with, with the other options that they have. So something to keep in mind. All right, so 10 ways that you can actually use social media to market your games. Uh, I don't know about notes. I'm going to give all the slides over. They have them, so I'm sure we can PDF and, and share however uh, the, the group seems, deems appropriate. So the first thing to do is listen. And this is really a basic step. If you're not involved in social media at all right now, this is probably a great way to do it. Set up alerts for your agency name, for your, your specific group, for the game you're working on. Um, also for just keywords around industry areas, things that you know are of concern, right? So um, if you're trying to do something very specific in a like area, like let's say clean water or something very, and you just want to see what the buzz is, this is a great way to do that. Uh, the other tool that you can also use is social mention. Anybody use this yet? Okay, this is a free tool too, um, which is great because it also gives you like a sentiment analysis in terms of how much is, is being said is positive and negative, you have to take this with a, with a grain of salt because sentiment analysis is still very in its nascent stages. So the best it can do is if, it's, if it, like, it decides which words are positive and negative, but they may not be. So I'll give you an example. One of our clients is YMCA, 
And uh, this past summer, we did like this, like, l don't drown, learn how to swim. But every time it saw the word drown, it was like negative, negative, negative. So if you saw the sentiment analysis, it was like, people are really talking a smack about the why. But that, was <laughs> but that wasn't true. It was just because it was looking at those specific words and, or like looking at obesity. And it's like, that's a, a bad word or a negative word. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. But it lets you sort of look at what it's also putting as positive or negative. So it's not like it's not... You know, uh, but it's a great tool just if you're starting out and you want to say, what are people talking about? Uh, great way before you sort of uh, to dip your toe in the water. All right, make social media an extension of your game. So oftentimes people will have this one persona with their games and then their social media voice will not match it at all. And you see this and it's uh, really personified when you see some like violent video games that are out there and you know these guys are all about like killing and points and you see the social media presence like company X, Y, and Z would like to sincerely thank you and the, the community is so confused because they're like wait a second I thought this was about the game and you know this is a very corporate voice. Uh, so that's not to say that it has to be um, not politically correct, or I know you guys have rules and regulations, and of course, it's just to say that you want to try to make that an extension as possible. So you guys familiar with Hunger Games, the book series and the movie and, and all that? So they, they actually did a really, as a case study goes, they did a really good job utilizing the book and the games and their, the extension of social media. So they didn't just set up a website for the movie, they set up the capital.pn. So Pan Am is the, is the city that, you know, like this, I guess, supposed country or whatnot. And that domain, that actual, that .pn actually belongs to like some island nation, that that's where they hosted the domain name. Uh, but it's really cool because they called it like the citizen information terminal. And it very much kept with sort of that look and that idea that, um, you know, the verbiage was very similar. It made people feel like it, they were very much part of that community, if that makes sense. And so yours may not be this black and white, but just be conscious that as you do social media, it really should be an extension of your brand messaging and the, the, what you're trying to convey. All right, engage in digital PR. This is a great way to get your games out there, is to get bloggers to talk about it. Um, in any given area, there are bloggers who already cover the area. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just still wrapping my hand. No worries. <laughs> Slide three. Um, if you're U.S. government and you're doing a behavior change game and you're using uh, characters and illustrations and music that's you know localized and it's, you know it's hip hop and it's cool and it's yeah. young. But communities will more often not see the donor, like a U.S. government agency is not cool, hip, young, hip hop. It's more either driven down by the government or, you know, old people in suits coming to their village. Or, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to figure out what that how we match ourselves sure. to the game. Sure, sure. And there's a lot of ways tactically to do that once you recognize that as a goal and as and how do you integrate that. So right, one would be do separate strategies. One would be very much like around, like let's say a character is really beloved or you've got someone going who people really feel like, this is so cool. You can build a campaign around that character. Now, that's sort of one way to separate it. The other way would be to do, let's say you have a page already for the agency, US government, there's a lot going on. You can also create sub tabs, right? Sub uh, areas within that page that are more focused in that sort of language and uh, highlight those characters. So there's a way to balance that, but I think the important thing is recognizing that, hey, guess what? We want to try to pull as much as possible, but then how do we tactically just tie those things together, if that makes sense? But for example, on Facebook pages, it does, it lets you create. Now it calls them apps, but it lets you create separate areas if you want for uh, things that you want to highlight. Does that make sense? Yeah, your conversation makes sense. I'm, your conversation makes sense. I'm still trying to, like my agency has Facebook pages within right. the country. Um, they pretty much, even though they're done at the field level, they're pretty much all the same. And they go through huge clearances with legislative and public affairs to have that branding look. <laughs> Yeah. So I'm still trying to figure out what, how we could. Can you do it on a project basis? Can your project have a separate one and do a sort of transmedia thing for your project? 
I mean, one that would be sort of in the voice of it through your project rather than through the agency? Is no, that because those were all stripped out when we went at a project level. I'm sorry, what? Yeah. They were stripped out. They oh. Were, they oh. Were, we were told to take them off. So, yeah, I don't want to hijack this. No, just, no, not at all. Point I'm two, actually I think it's super <laughs> important. I totally agree with it. I'm actually and also thinking I'm about thinking it. Um, see, I, I think that's that. sort of the difficulty because I may not totally understand all the rules and regulations, and I know there's there's a myriad of them. Um, that is tough. And, I, I mean, again, the best thing I could think of is maybe, like, sub pages within what the agencies are already doing. Uh, but again, I don't know how that works in terms of getting just approvals to be able to do that. But that is an important part of it, you know. So I, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Please, please. One of the reasons that we have. Thank you. One of the reasons that we have. Now that I'm being recorded. One of the reasons we have these talks is to, to give us information and, and strategy. And you're right, I, it, you probably can't go right now and implement it. But now you have this talk to fall back on and expertise to come and say strategically, we need to be incorporating these into our social media policy, uh, which I know will move at lightning speed in government. But uh, <laughs> it's it's to help change the, we can't necessarily implement everything or 90% of what we get out of these talks immediately, but it, it is useful. I know it helps if it's not just me back at NASA going, you know, we really should answer people when we, they post on our social media site. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it helps if an outside authority who's not considered half crazed comes in and says, you know, you should answer people. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what, that happens a lot. So like one time this company that does a lot of B2G work called me in and they said, uh, and this marketing director called me in and, I, and she said, I want you to come talk to our team and all these marketing folks. And I said, sure. And I was talking to her, I was like, this lady is really intelligent. I said, you get this stuff. I was like, clearly as I'm, you know, you're matching me point by point to point, like you get it, why? I mean, why bring me in? She goes, yeah, but because if they hear it from you, they'll believe it. <laughs> and so I think it was a lot of it was a matter of because she just stood in front of them and said this over and over, but they were like, I guess it was just one of those things where, you know, they, uh, an so outside opinion. Uh, so what what happens when you're, uh, when you're overwhelmed? So, I mean, we, you know, one of the things that happened with, with the budget game is we got 10 or 20,000 emails. Yes. Now, how do we deal with that? I mean, we, we, we started to think about, can we dump all these into a database and data mine them? Yeah, so. so um, it's, it's sort of like, I think part of it is, there, there's, also, there's, there's this fear that we won't get anything. Yeah. But then there's also this issue of, you get a lot, and a lot of that's some of that's just, boy, this is a great, it's a crappy game. It's but some of it's yeah. really important, it's, and it's, it, 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 you're really kind of you're trying to figure out how do you get this extract a signal from the noise. And, right. that, and that's a, and that's a good question. And so uh, here's you can use in a lot of ways technology to help automate this. I think what you have to be careful of is not coming off robotic. So as, as when you send an email, I think it's fine to have an automated response that says, look, we got it. We're so glad this game has been a success and we've gotten tens and thousands of, of emails. Clearly one is focused on doing different you know, work that actually makes, is productive and is actionable, but we wanna let you know that we will do our best to incorporate the suggestions and then you sort of pick and choose what makes sense to respond to you. Because a lot of this is gonna, you know, it's not gonna be directly actionable or people are saying, good job, you know, glad you guys are doing this or someone's gonna be like, I can't believe you voted for this guy. Like, there's, it spans, right? There's uh, all these different comments. Uh, and so I think you do have the ability to pick and choose. A lot of it comes into being very clear uh, in, in the beginning. So one thing that I highly recommend is creating a social media policy. And when I say that, I don't mean like a textbook policy. I, I don't mean like, let's, you know, spend the next year drafting something. I mean, it's very simple that says, this is why we're using the page. Here is what we respond to. Here is what we appreciate, but we just can't get to right now. Um, here is what we won't tolerate. And what this does is it gives you, a lot of people feel, uh, you know, and, and this is some of the fear of behind agencies and government stuff is this loss of control right, that the message might get hijacked. And I think the important thing is to say, you have more control than you realize, but it's about setting the ground rules. When you delete something, someone's gonna say censorship, I can't believe you removed it because it was negative. But if you say, no, look, we have our policy right here. It very clearly states that if you are derogatory to another group of people, we will delete it, these are our rules. And then other people support that because they're like, look, they did put out that policy. They made it very clear. Um, if you want an example of good policy, check school district policies. 
they do a really good job of, of any website that uh, for a school district they make it really clear as to what's appropriate, what's not, and they do it in kid language so kids <laughs> understand when they're posting there. And it may be that just that. So I don't think the sense is that you have to respond to every single one personally. Uh, but if you can automate some of that and find a way to, and, and it is, some of it is filtering. Uh, and a good way to do that may be hashtags too. So we'll talk about that in, in just a second. So engaging again in, in blogger outreach, really useful when you're trying to get the message out for your games. Alltop.com is like a one, one site which is uh, pulls from blogs around uh, the, the web. And so you can choose based on different categories, look at bloggers, and then send them the ideas. And I find that most bloggers, and I'm, I'm part of this world, are very eager to help for the common good. If you reach out to them and you say, look, this is what we're trying to do and here's how it helps, most of them are, are very, very willing to get the message out there. But I think, and also, you know, it's a, it's a matter of respect, right? Like, look, we read your blog. We think it's great. We love that you're reaching this audience. We want to leverage that and here's what we're trying to do. And you'll find that most of them are very willing if you approach them correctly. And that's with a sense of as... Um, in a way of like as a citizen as a citizen journalist as a way of like hey i think your work is good congrats on building this community here's what we're trying to do and you'll find that they're much more likely to help okay so this is one way to sort of filter noise signal how do we respond set up your own hashtag so anybody use twitter right now for their practices anybody have a hashtag already set up so yeah so hashtag is essentially um pound sign and a couple of um letters that make up a keyword, if you will, it keeps information organized. And you encourage people to use hashtag at conferences, at for games, anytime you're trying to bring people around a subject matter. Uh, they actually came about when people used to go to conferences and they would be sharing what they're learning, but it was irrelevant to everybody else who might be following them, except maybe the two other people who were also at the conference. And so like a hashtag, so I'll, I'll tell you, South by Southwest 12, for example, putting that at the end of every tweet would make it really nice because it would allow people to say, follow that hashtag and get information. Same thing when, you know, Sandy happens, anything major happens, the Egypt thing, hashtags emerge and people use that to follow information. The Egypt thing. Um, <laughs> and so there is this site called Tag Def that lets you see what hashtags exist already in case you're wondering if the one you're thinking of is already taken. It also lets you see sort of trending tags. Uh, tweet Chat is just a nice tool. You can put a hashtag in there. You don't actually have to even be on Twitter to do this, but you look at a hashtag and it, um, it pulls all the content out in a very clean interface that lets you see what's being said. I did this just very randomly. I put Halo 4 just to see what conversations were like. Uh, but as you do this, if you set up a hashtag, you can also do tweet sheet, uh, sorry, tweet chats. I'll try saying that three times. Uh, the other thing that you can also do with this is set up regular tweet chats. This is something that's new on Twitter now, relatively new. So you can say, you know, every second, um, Thursday of the month, we're going to have this tweet chat where people can use this hashtag and engage on this particular topic. And AARP does this really well. A lot of organizations who are just trying to pull people together uh, do this. You, do you know one of the first users, a group of users on Twitter was seventh grade teachers? Like you would think what, how unlikely, but really they wanted to connect with other seventh grade teachers around the country because evolution was such a tricky subject. And as they, they were like, what's worked in your district? How is that useful? And that's, I mean, that's a great thing. In fact, I would recommend that this group have a hashtag and that you share ideas and questions and things as they pop up. And the beauty of a hashtag is also, in Twitter in general, is yes, it's instant, but it doesn't have to be. And I think that's also a lot of the fear that people have sometimes in terms of someone tweeted, I have to tweet back. But that really is a more internal sense of urgency rather than an actual, like nobody expects tweets to be responded to immediately. I mean, unless it's very, <laughs> unless like the house is burning, t Twitter even, <laughs> because it's quick, it gives that sense, it freaks people out because they're like, oh my God, I have to respond to all this. No, you can do it in your own time. It does not have to be responded to immediately. All right, create a game trailer. Uh, for the games that you're doing for YouTube. This is a really fun way to build buzz. 
online video is so underutilized still in web marketing, despite how many people prefer online video to anything else. So I'll give you a stat. 64% of people will finish watching up to a 30 minute commercial video clip versus 24% who'll finish reading an article. That's huge. That's, that's absolutely huge. You're gonna reach so many more people through online video than you would through the written word, which to me is odd because I am a reader. So when I think of that, I'm like, wouldn't it just be easier to read something than watch? And often I will choose to read a transcript over watching a video, but then that's not most people. And so you have to look at what does your audience prefer in terms of a method, but YouTube's great. Uh, so create, I encourage you to create like a quick little game trailer uh, to build up awareness. It's a great way to get out there found a, an example for an angry, uh, the Angry Birds game. All right, create an editorial calendar. This is really important. If you start on a social media strategy, ha figuring out what you wanna say, um, even if it's not like specific, but a general framework is very important. So a big thing I often get is social media is like a time drain, right? And this one guy, he's like, oh, Facebook doesn't work at all. And I said, oh, why do you say that? And he said, I spent three hours looking up X's. And I was like, <laughs> so I was like and that is Facebook's fault because. Uh, so it's, it's, it's kind of akin to this. If you've ever gone grocery shopping hungry, you know that you come back with stuff that you would never buy on a full stomach, right? Like you bought cat food, but you don't really have a cat, so <laughs> not really sure what you were thinking. But the packaging really looked really good, right? And, I, and I'm, I'm guilty of that, and it's we all do this. But if you go in with a list, what happens? You usually come out with that list, unless you're hu my husband, and then he always manages to like sneak more stuff on the list. But in general, most people stick to the list. Social media is very similar. If you have a list, if you know what you're trying to accomplish, and you know what you're going to say, and how you're going to go about saying it, that's not to say this is so static and you can't be willing to adapt. I would say the 80-20 rule works here. 80% is structured content, engaging, how do you keep the community involved. 20% is being able to roll with the punches when things happen. So creating an editorial calendar is highly encouraged for marketing your games. Okay, integrate social advertising. Um, if you were anywhere around <laughs> this planet, the last two years have, and especially the last two months, you were bombarded by political advertising on social networks across the board. And the reason is because it works. You know, social advertising can be very, very powerful. So there is that organic social media effort, but there's also the paid effort that can really help launch that campaign, especially when you're starting a page when you don't have a lot of fans. Advertising can really help. Um, I'll highlight a few things here, but I'll tell you, how many, how many have ever done like Google AdWords or search engine advertising? So let me explain to you the difference between search engine ad advertising and social media advertising, the, the big difference. So search engine advertising is very much what someone is looking for, right? They're looking for certain terms, keywords, like, hey, this is us, here's what you're looking for. Social media advertising is very much who someone is and based on that, what they might be looking for. Does that make sense? So like, let's say bikes, making totally this, t making this up. Let's say I look for a bike on Google. If I search that, I'm gonna find shops that sell bikes. On Facebook, it's more like, hey, if I like, if I like adventure, and I'm between this age group, and I show that I'm a fan of cycling, then guess what? I might be interested in the latest bike. So social advertising is more who someone is. If you have a very strong sense of your target demographic, then social media advertising is very powerful. Now that one caveat to that rule, if you will, is Twitter, which now lets you do uh, pay for terms, very much like Facebook, if someone's tweeting about certain terms or searching for certain terms, that your ad will pop up. Now, and you, we saw this and you found an article that, that showcased how the Obama campaign used this. But these features are not available to everyone. They, call, they say that these are in beta. What this means is you have to have a decent sized budget and have an ad rep within the actual social network who can help you with this. So what is available right now is Facebook is pretty general. You can, uh, they don't really have any advertising air things in beta, at least not most of them. There's lots of different things on Facebook that you can do. I'm happy to get into it if you want me to. Twitter, 
can let you promote your account, meaning get more followers based on your demographics, or promote your tweets, like specific things that you're trying to uh, say and share. But in terms of getting your tweets to show up for certain keywords, that's still reserved for people who have ad budgets and hence a rep within the organization. Did you want to add anything to that, Diane? I know you were. Oh, okay, all right. Yes, please. I'm not a, a Facebook user. I, I lurk. You know, I've, my dog has a page and I go through that. So, <laughs> um, But there are something that I noticed recently, and I, I, I don't like anything. Like, don't, is it not on, Lauren? No, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. You're okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I never hit the like button. Yeah. But when I bought a plane ticket for Thanksgiving through like kayak.com, and I went, all of a sudden I noticed that there was a lot of airline yeah. ads over there. But so I, I didn't really understand how that targets me because I'm not going through anything. I'm just going yeah, on my Yeah, so Google, right? Facebook is using the same thing which a lot of sites do. It's called retargeting. Yeah. So what it does is puts a cookie on your browser and it has a relationship with Facebook that where you come on Facebook, you'll see an ad for that. Same thing for Nordstrom's. If you want to test this out, go to Nordstrom's, look up something, go to Facebook, and you'll see that the ads have followed you there. Okay. Um, much to my husband's chagrin, a pair of earrings have now been haunting me for a month. <laughs> so it, it happens. Um, but that's what they're using. It's retargeting. And now I see, though, that people, you know, friends' posts, you can actually hit a button that moves your post to the top of the line or get promoted more, posts yeah, yep. promoting your posts. Yeah. So, so what what's is true that what is, you're talking about here? Uh, this is just, I'm trying to yeah, relate so to what I've bit, seen. There's, there's so many different types of advertising now. So just to give you a quick breakdown, you have the basic cost per click per impression. You know, you pay for what demographic people click. Then you have retargeting is what you're talking about. Someone leaves, comes to Facebook, they see the ad, you know, it follows them, retargets the audience essentially. You have custom audience ads, which now let you import email addresses that you may collect into Facebook. And if it has an account, you can market to those people as well. Um, there's now internal. So these are external marketing. There's also internal marketing, which means if you have a Facebook page, even if you have a profile, you're not reaching everybody with every update. In fact, you're only reaching, if you have a page, 5 to 14% of people at any given time. The way you increase the number of people internally that get to see your information is that you promote these posts and you pay for it. So there's, there's a lot of different ways. And in fact, I highly recommend using this because if you built up a community but you want to reach more of them, then yes, you need to use promoted posts. Yeah. Uh, I will recommend, though, before anybody jumps in and starts uh, <laughs> opening up an account and, and paying uh, Facebook, uh, we at GSA are in discussions with Facebook about this very issue because we know that most federal agencies do not have money to advertise and really aren't even allowed to advertise. So uh, we're trying to have a dialogue with them and say, look, it may work for big brands, Coke and Nike and McDonald's. That model doesn't work for for us. So uh, just just know that that is under discussion and, and in the works of trying to come up with a better solution for for federal agencies so that our content doesn't get completely lost. Yeah, it, it's interesting, and you know, it, it'll be interesting to see what that results in in terms of your your discussions and negotiations facebook has a, an interesting dilemma i mean their valuation was pretty high <laughs> uh and i think there's a lot of questions about it but now they have to prove that valuation and so not only do they have to get ads but they have to sort of juice everything they have out of what they like for example mark cuban just did a article and in interview and he said they're pulling from facebook because the same thing, I mean, they have to keep paying to reach more users. It may not be how they always do that. In fact, Facebook is very good at, at turning and pivoting and saying, you know what, this doesn't work, let's try something else. Uh, but I think it's great that they hear feedback like that, especially from an organization that has clout that says, look, here's why, you know, if we pull out of this, then it'll, it'll get media attention and it'll be negative media attention. And it's better that you actually just look at your practices and see what we might be able to do. They may, they may say that if you have a nonprofit page, that you are able to reach a bigger percent of your, of your audience. The other thing, though, is they are still not officially saying 
that that's what they're doing. So that makes that adds a whole different level of, 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 of difficulty when they're not willing to say, yes, you do need to, you know, outrightly say you need to re pay us to reach more people. All right, eight, encourage visuals. Memes and infographics do really well. They travel faster. Um, so sometimes I know when people see things like that, they're like, wait, that's, that's not what we were going for. But that's okay. If you see that someone takes something from that game and runs with it, uh, encourage it. You know, it's a great way to, to get the message out there. And there are. There are lots of different infographics and memes out there. In fact, if you really want, create your own. One that you feel would be agency approved and still have sort of that humor and personality and, and whatnot. Um, and, and share that. Infographics which are a little more serious than memes, but are you know great way to take lots of data and make it creative, uh, make it be creative in a creative way and share that across the board. And these get shared a lot more. Memes, graphics, infographics, videos, multimedia gets shared uh, twice as much as just you know content. Run a contest, these are really fun. Uh, for people entering them, not if you're running them, but <laughs> um, and every site has its own rules. For example, Facebook doesn't allow you to run contests on your page. You have to use like a third-party app. Uh, one good app is like ShortStack. We use that uh, for our clients. So contests are fun. These are just different ways of keeping people engaged. Um, it can be very much on point. It can be timely. Like Halloween, you s we saw a rise in a bunch of Halloween apps. Now holidays, we're going to see that again. Uh, do you guys remember like Office Depot's Little Elves? You could put the face on and the elves did that little dance or whatnot. So creative things like that will help uh, increase virality, if you will, in terms of promoting your games. And then 10, I'll just share some cool tools with you that I think are might be good in terms of time saving as you're trying to do some of this. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. Postling allows you to post the same status update across multiple sites. So as to what you were saying, if you're managing Twitter and Facebook and, and LinkedIn and maybe some other sites, this lets you post one update, post it across the board after you set it up. You have to use this with a light hand. Don't respond to people or like read, you know, don't put RT, like retweet on this because that's not Facebook lingo. Some things are site specific, but this is great if you have an announcement, You've, you know, s something big has just happened, s a new position, things like that. It's a great tool for buffer app. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier in terms of not everyone gets to see the content you post. Buffer app essentially analyzes your algorithms for when people are most likely to interact with your stuff based on history. And when you post things, it chooses the time that's best for each network to post and automatically posts it for you. I will tell you on Facebook, it's always better to post directly because you will get more views that way. Uh, Facebook doesn't give third-party apps as much feed space as it does if you do your direct status update. But again, these are good tools to save time and get a message across. And this just really helps you sort of optimize in terms of time. This is the geekiest of all. Does anybody know this? If this, then that. Yeah, my friend. All right, cool. So this is, <laughs> this is, it's a very geeky I tool. Out, I'm the social media guy for okay, GSA. Okay, good. So. All right, good. So um, hopefully you still got something out of this. And that is, that tends to be sort of my high. Most people have no idea what it is, but this is neat because it lets you create, well, I'll say this delicately. It has recipes that you can use to help technology work for you. So it's a very simple example. If it was going to rain tomorrow, you wish you got a text message that says, it's going to rain, take an umbrella you can set up a recipe to do that. So only when it, if it's going to rain tomorrow, it sends you an email, and you can automate that. You can automate things like if someone thanks you on Twitter or mentions the game, that they get a message. If they use a certain hashtag, something happens. So this is a great way to sort of automate certain actions. Again, use these tools with a light hand. You, what you don't want to do is come across so robotic that you've taken out that interactive aspect of it. Um, so anyways, great tools. Here are some of my information. I'm happy, of course, to do Q&A right now, and I'll stick around, uh, since, especially since we have cookies. So as long as the cookies last, I will be around. When the cookies are over, I will leave. Uh, but other than that, let's, let's, let's talk. Hi, and thank you. Uh, it was very helpful and informative. Good. Um, I'm with the National Endowment for Arts. We don't produce games, but we fund games through our media arts artworks program. And uh, 
we we see the need uh, and the interest uh, among applicants to promote their work through social media, but not necessarily the sophistication of thinking. They they recognize we're going to do Facebook, we're going to do Twitter. The tools, not strategies. How would you encourage both all of us here and uh, for us speaking with our applicants, potential applicants, to kind of move beyond the tools and talk about techniques and, and how to reach their own specific audiences? Thank right, you. So that's a really good question. And I always say start with paper first. And it doesn't mean paper. I use an iPad, whatever. But start with, and this is the same thing we do when someone says, I want to use Facebook. We always go back to why. So if you forget social media exists for a second in terms of tools and you start very much with what am I trying to do, who am I trying to reach, what are we trying to get across and what are our goals, and then fit mediums to meet those goals, you have a much more robust strategy. And I think that's what I would recommend is don't do this because you feel like we have to do Facebook or we have to do Twitter. Look at what it is you're trying to do. What's the audience you're trying to reach? And then what tool makes sense? And, you know, sometimes none of those tools make sense. For example, we do work with a lot of B2B companies. LinkedIn is their best bet. Right? Hosting webinars is much more powerful. So it just depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, but, yes, I, I think it, it helps to say Forget all the tools for a second and let's figure out s sort of the what, when, why, how, where, and then we'll figure out the specific tools that will help us get there. So I know it seems, it seems so archaic, but really that's what it takes is sort of to go back and say, where does this fit into the bigger picture? Great. Thank you. Sure. My pleasure. How does it, can I just ask you a question? How does that work when you do, when you do solicitations, though? So for the grant-making agencies, um, when you guys solicit, I mean, is, is there a specific piece in the solicitation that says you have to have a social media strategy or? Uh, just to respond briefly, I, I think the only thing we specify is they have to have a plan for outreach and engagement. Okay. And that could mean both kind of traditional uh, you know, tools, postcards, uh, how do you, you know, your mailing list, things like that, uh, but also since these tools are um, um, accessible and everywhere, uh, especially when it comes into reaching out to younger audiences who are more adept and natural users of this technology, uh, we look for that as a sign of, uh, is it appropriate for the audience they want to reach? Um, if you're using social media to reach a, a very targeted group, how are they going to do that? Mm -hmm. as, as a big world. So in previous meetings about game development, we've sort of heard, you know, how much of my resources do I need to sort of focus on artwork versus the engine versus this versus that? Can you give me a sense sort of what fraction of my budget I should set aside for a campaign like this if I, and, and if I do that and I'm going to spend actual money on that, what can you actually expect the, the sort of percentage increase in the number of people who see my game? I mean, I know that's a hard question to answer, but, but really that's your hard. business. Well, yeah, but, it's, but it's, it is, it is. Um, and the answer is different for everyone, right? Depends on the game, depends on the audience. Is, is, is it like a smaller pool? Is it a huge pool? So, so much depends. Even in terms of budget, I, I wish I could give you a number. If I gave you one, I really would be just pulling one out of thin air. What I can say is integrate marketing right from the beginning during game development. Don't look at it like, you know, pre-game, post-game, during, and then post, here's, we need to add the marketing element. But having that throughout uh, helps. I can give you a general sense of what social media campaigns run. They start at about $5,000 a month. That's agency pricing, and they can go all the way up from there, just depending on what type of campaign you're running. So, but any percentage I'd give you would be just, it would be a BS number, and I'd rather not do that. Okay. But, but starting at 5,000 does yes. give you sort yes. of a baseline budget. Yes, for, for, for budget. decent social media campaigns, yeah. yes. Okay. And Thanks. what are the increments beyond that? Is then, and what, what are, is it the harder, presumably the, the harder? The increments are huge. It, a lot of it just depends on, well, one, it'll depend on the agency, right? Their own, their own brand, like if they're a bigger agency versus a smaller entrepreneurial firm, different things like that. Uh, the audience... There's also going to be then you're going to have the agency fee, but you're going to also have an advertising budget, and they'll be separate, very much like you would in, in traditional advertising. Uh, but they do; they go up. To, really, they, if I've I've seen millions of dollars spent on social media. So, but that's sort of the the ground floor level. I would say the average probably runs about five to twenty k a month. 
I, I have a question about what happens when you have a product and it's ready to go and suddenly you need social media or it's very <laughs> scattered uh, across the board. Um, social media came about after the yeah. origination of this project. Now we have it in finished form. It's going online. Awesome. It's launching next week. <laughs> <laughs> There's two Facebook pages, Man By Me. One is the main character, Trace, and I'm hoping that he'll engage with audiences. The other is an information page to like tell would-be users about yeah. the updates when it's getting shipped yeah. out, when it's coming. But yeah. that doesn't seem like it's very integrated, and it doesn't seem like it's really reaching everybody. But with one person, maybe two others, what do you do when you're trying yeah. to reach Yeah, one, I would recommend that you integrate the two pages. I mean, you can certainly have just an, an um, a, they used to call it landing pages, but just a, a section within the page that lists what someone's, right, like updates, news and updates, just like you would on a website, just have that area and, and list that. It wouldn't keep necessarily two pages because it really is, you're diluting your audience as well. I think it's fine to go with the character. Mm -hmm. um, it is tougher that you're so close to launch, but it's not impossible. There's still a lot you can do. I would get bloggers involved. I would email them and, and do digital PR. So I would ask someone in the office to, you know, that all top site get together, put together a list of 30 bloggers who write about games, who are interested in this. And they may just not be games, right? There's there's the intersection of, of games, but also your department and just the things that you guys are passionate about. Um, are you with the State Department? Yeah. OK, I've done stuff with you guys. I'll blog about it. Email me, right? <laughs> so it's a very easy transition. Um, get Getting that kind of buzz will really help. Um, some of the tactics that I shared on here will help. So it's not going to be. It's not ideal, but that's not to say, oh, once it's launched, there's nothing we can do. You can. Um, but I would recommend, so when resources are tight, consistency trumps um, like multiple platforms, if you will. So choose like maybe Facebook and Twitter, but do them really well rather than saying, oh, we also need to do YouTube and maybe we should try Tumblr. Keep them, uh, you know, just, just stay consistent with what you're doing. And that'll be more important than trying multiple platforms. Okay. Um, added challenge. Our, <laughs> our audience is international, and yeah. because of governmental restrictions, um, we're not able to really advertise this within the United States. So it's going completely external, Okay. because um, it is considered a publication made by the State Department. So it goes external. So we can't really do too much internal United States-wide publications, um, and we don't really have a PR strategy mapped out. There was one that came out maybe two months ago and it got shifted around by the brass and then it came back and nothing happened of it. So we don't really have like a plan, you know, we don't have a business plan, we don't have a PR plan, we don't have a social media plan. Do you have a backup plan? <laughs> For yourself. <laughs> For yourself. Vacation? <laughs> I don't know. No. Okay. So, I mean, these are all challenges that are coming about. I, I don't think silence would be the best option at this point <laughs> because it's coming, regardless of whether we have the plan. So one, just keep your resume in ca ready, right? Like just in <laughs> case, like you never know where this is gonna lead. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the shorter answer is yes, you need a plan. Mm -hmm. the, the longer answer is it doesn't have to be a very robust plan. You just need to be able to leverage some of the resources that you have. Like I know with the State Department, one of the things you do have going for you is that you have all these people internationally uh, a really strong support team, right? So I would look at how can you reach that internal team to short get that message out there and leverage their networks. That might be sort of the easier short-term way to do that. Long-term way would be just to get a, put together a plan. And it's very hard because clearly you've spent money and time and efforts doing this, but what's the point if it's not reaching this audience and that may be something to put in your next report? <laughs> um, you know, you said you have Facebook. Um, you know, every country, ha while every country has Facebook, Facebook is not number one in every country. So, as you you know, reach out, send some internal messages to you know the international folks, and they could probably help identify. You know what? What is it? Uh, Orchid, I think, in Brazil. Uh, you know, there's there's different social networks in different countries that you may want to have have the local uh, outlet 
uh, you know, promote. Yeah. Yeah. We're good. Hi, so just to, I guess, build on that. So other than, I guess, personal embarrassment, <laughs> is there anything wrong with delaying launch by a month? Even if a month would buy you, you know, enough time to, I mean, you know, I mean, because there's really usually very hard overriding mission essential reason to launch a game on, you know, this day versus that day, so. And on that note, on that note, I think that's important. You're talking about budgets, right? And sort of what may be, be more important is to figure out production cycle-wise when do these talks need to be happening, and if you work that mar if you work marketing in as a piece of that launch schedule, right? So 60 days before we launch, here's what needs to happen. 90 days, and so going forward, that may be something to try and incorporate, and just say just like you do launch dates, having a PR launch date and a marketing launch date is really important just to overlay on top of what you're doing. Yeah. So how, 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 let's assume something happens, bad ha bad things happen to people. Okay. How do you use social <laughs> media, <laughs> how do you use social media to recover from a bad launch, a bad game? Um, you know, a lot of times people spend a, lo a lot of effort and, and time worried about bad but that really is sort of the, the rare story. It's not the norm. Like when I talk to people, the most common questions are like, what if something bad happens? But if you talk in reality, like stuff that campaigns, it's such a slim margin of something bad. But let's say that, you know, crisis communication wise, something bad, you need a plan, but <laughs> you do. Ideally you have a plan. Ideally you have bloggers on your side, people who are willing to tell the story. Um, just a couple of key things to remember if something negative does happen is you want to respond and you want to respond fast. Even if the response is, we're working on a response. The worst thing you can do is just go like quiet or pretend it's not happening. What? What? People are saying bad things? Um, so it's just to say, look, we've heard, these are concerns. We hear you. We're working on this. Please give us, you know, a day to, to, to respond to this in the matter that it does, in the, in the manner that it deserves. What's bad is when people just don't say anything and then it snowballs into a much bigger deal. So good question, and that would be my advice sort of across the board for that. Oh, I, I was just gonna say, this would be a good example of if you're developing a game, have it in a, a beta version, mm -hmm. put it out online, or you know, an alpha version and then a beta version, put some of that online and let people bang around on it and find out where the pain points are before you push it, you know, you send it up. And then you can say, hey, look, we listened to you. Look at all these changes that we implemented in the game. And suddenly everyone says, wow, what a great, you know, look, look at how responsive they were. Not they made this game without even thinking about us. Um, to th well, actually, I'll follow that. I had another question. But the last time I talked with Rick, that game, weren't you doing a beta, like internally, government-wide? Because then if, it, if that beta is happening, those are the people that you ask to use their network through their implementing partners, through their um, the ministry contacts that they're using in country, through their um, cultural section of uh, the, the, mission, the embassies, things like that. So you, know, you, you can use that beta test to go into the, uh, the international audience, maybe. Just thought. So the question I, I had um, was that you, you said, uh, what am I trying to do, who am I trying to reach, and then what tool makes sense? And this group has talked a lot about tools and platforms and other, uh, other talks and other meetings. And uh, in my agency in the game, that we've had a real slow run to get where we are now and that's great because it's we really had to socialize it even within the agency to allow them to move us to move forward and then and we had to have a you know mechanism to you to utilize and then we had major staffing changes within the mechanism so now cut to the chase right now we um have new people on board new implementing part well same implementing partner new staff because they've come on they want to switch things up it's sort of almost easier to 
sort of toss away the problems and start new, right? You know, everyone wants to gut your bathroom and, you know, every contractor comes in, they want to gut your bathroom instead of just, like, just change the tile, right? So, um, because we had decided on a Facebook game based on a lots of different inputs, mm -hmm. this new group says, no, we want to do mobile. One, well, this is the reason why, and they've shared with us a number of articles that recently came out, I think, on Flurry.com about, the, you know, 49% of the people are using their media for games, and here's smart tablets versus phones, and phones are 53%, mm -hmm. smart tablets are 40, and, and, and PCs and things like this. So this is not a question to you and your organization, although I'd ask it around the room, like, so guys, what do you think? <laughs> like, should we go to mobile? But the reason why I ask it here, because your presentation was a, a lot about the social marketing and the avenues, um, but what about when it's on a phone? Because the phone is very limiting. There's not, it, when you said make it easy, sometimes the phone, because that's what people have, but it's not really pretty and easily and accessible. There, it, it, there's just, it's a different platform, so. Right, well I think even with the phone, it's, it's a lot about the user interface of the game specifically. I think a, sp and a lot of these things apply for mobile apps too, because we've used them for mobile apps. I mean, all the, the building that community and stuff, even though people are playing the game on the phone, they're not opposed to going online to engage with the community or do these things or learn. I mean, a lot of the mobile apps I d download is because I heard about them online first, and then I you know get my smartphone and do that. The other thing that's really important with mobile apps um, and, I, and I can discuss a little more about Facebook versus mobile too, if you'd like me to. But the other thing, yeah, the other thing though about the um, mobile apps is that reviews matter a lot. So getting initially strong reviews is going to be important. Uh, the other thing is working with like iTunes or working with the different. Um, marketplaces, I think it's actually called marketplace for Android, and working with their, because they all have sort of algorithms in search of like how do you become top 25 games, unpaid, top 25 paid games. The goals should be to get in that list. It's a tough list to, to break, but if you can, it's kind of like being a New York Times bestseller or whatever, right? Like it's the it's the games that get the most, it's like the, the tipping effect. After you make that list, you get a lot more downloads because you're already a popular game. Uh, but reviews matter a lot. And so, yeah. I, I just want to add that our, our market is only developing countries. Uh, and not very uh, access oriented development. Okay, and and that's and that's fine too. And I would do research in terms of what that looks like, even in those developing countries. But the reviews still are the are the biggest thing because in any marketplace app marketplace you go, the first thing you'll see is reviews for the app. And so having a strong initial user group who's going to be uh, who's really going to make the most of it and be willing to leave a review, ideally a positive review. There's not much you can control about that though. Is going to be very important with mobile. Uh, Facebook apps versus mobile apps. Facebook right now is just, you know, uh, they're going through a lot of changes. What they have done, though, to their credit, is they have given apps a lot more um, priority than they did before. So apps were really important on Facebook. Everybody started creating apps. Then they changed everything, and apps were nowhere. Like, they dropped. I mean, they, were, they weren't important anymore. So all these people said, we just spent millions of dollars on apps, and you killed the marketplace. They reverted that, and with the timeline features, apps are again prominent, right? They've, they've changed that and they've given more prominence. Um, in developing countries, mobile phones are, you know, smartphones are more accessible than, than Facebook, and that may be a smarter way to go given the audience. I'm not, I mean, I'm sure they've, you guys have done the research and you've seen that, but like, for example, I was in, uh, I was in, uh, at the St. Gallen Symposium in Switzerland two years ago now. And this one group was creating a literacy app for uh, women in India, but it was a, and they created a smartphone app because they said they don't have access to computers, but they all have access to a smartphone. And so if you are going after that target market, then a mobile app may be better suited and more local PR, more local, like what kind of we're talking about, what works within that area, that sort of push might be better. Um, but I, I would say that mobile sounds at least like it would be uh, at least very initially surface wise that it would get you more downloads than maybe a, a Facebook app. 
sorry to cut in. Uh, we've actually extended our stay in this room longer than we have access to it. So um, we can continue this conversation. And in fact, the reason I brought cookies and all that stuff is we can move that stuff into the hallway, but we do have to uh, let other people have access to this room now. So again, thanks all for coming. And please, you're very welcome to stay. It was, as you know, it was our intention. We intended for you to be here until 4 o'clock. We just had a chance to stay in this room longer, but we now have to take this group uh, into the uh, out there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you thank very much, Thank you again Holly. for hosting us.